like to think some of our politicians will. I've spoken to both uh, David Miliband, now at the Foreign Office, and also to David Cameron on some of these issues. And they're very, you know, they're, they, they, at the moment, are at that stage in life where they're ready to look at new ideas and so on and so forth. Whether they will carry them forward in a positive way, I can't tell you. I don't know what Gordon Brown thinks about this particular issue in any detail. I only know the outlines of what he's thinking. But I do know that the government is taking measures, and for that reason, they're ready to take measures which, um, which may prove to be unpopular in the short term. I mean, we know that occasionally politicians do take measures that are unpopular in the short term in the reasonable expectation that they will, their virtue will be evident later on. I mean, think of Ken Livingston and the congestion charge in London, which everyone tried to stop him doing and failed, and now it's very popular. So, I mean, you do, it, the, the whole question of how you work with politics is very complicated, and we'll have to see exactly how they work out. But I don't, believe, I don't give up. And um, I think, for example, the way in which Margaret Thatcher gave leadership on climate change in the 1980s was very good. And she didn't have any short-term uh, dividend to be paid. She just felt it was the right thing to do and said so. And there's somebody else who had a question down here, I think. No, first off, sorry, at the back there. Um, sorry, sorry, what were you saying? Uh, do you think that the Labour Party Yes, well, I mean, what else are we going to do? <laughs> There's no real alternative except to try hard to persuade people and to make clear the intellectual case. I'm very interested myself in, in the range of issues involved with moving from science and environment and academic considerations into the field of media understanding and indeed policy making. I'm running a seminar in Oxford in a few days' time on the relationship between scientific modelling and um, policy making. You just have to do what you can. There's no alternative because the people, you've just got to learn how you can influence people and use all the weapons at your disposal. The problem is that very often public opinion polls reflect a sort of general misunderstanding of the scene because the issues have not been put to them. I mean, I'm firmly against referendums. I think referendums are nearly always a mistake because they, they simplify things which are immensely complicated and we elect people in order to use their brains and come up with the best decisions. So you say widening the franchise. I mean, I in fact think that nearly, from my experience anyway, and that has not changed over the years, the big decisions are taken by relatively small groups of people. And the interesting question is how you influence those small groups of people. And um, the, the way in which, for example, the scientific community does so is very tricky. Um, because especially when you come to issues like climate change, there are lots of scientists who don't agree with each other. Although I think, in fact, there is a broad consensus at the moment. But on some of the issues which uh, Martin Rees raised, uh, nanotechnology, nuclear experimentation and the rest. Uh, again, there are many opinions and no one quite knows where it goes. And therefore, at some point or, or other, you have to introduce systems of regulation. Those will probably be pushed forward firmly by the relatively small number of people who understand the issues and probably quite a number of people will not like what is decided. And I should say that if you look through history, and I was hearing about this the other day, you realize that when you come to a a point when you have to make a decision, there are always a lot of options. And sometimes people make the wrong option. 
they may get the thing wrong. And it's sometimes extremely difficult to go back on the decision that you've taken. I referred a moment or two ago to chlorofluorocarbons and the, and the efforts to create international agreements to govern emissions which damage the ozone layer. I said then that a, a disaster nearly happened. But what actually, what, what I was referring to was this, that at some point the chemical companies invented something which would indeed have furthered the, the, uh, the use of, um, of, 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 would indeed have furthered electrification. It would have done a lot of good things of the kind of chlorofluorocarbons were designed to do. And indeed, they would have made um, refrigeration much easier. But they looked at it and they said, well, perhaps this isn't quite right. And they didn't go for it, but they did go for chlorofluorocarbons in the end. Well, chlorofluorocarbons turned out to be far from ideal, like some of the other inventions of the same kind. But they haven't done as much damage as would have happened had the first option been examined. And I can assure you that at that time, very few, very few politicians would have had the slightest idea what scientists were talking about. So the issue of the ozone layer contains some quite interesting lessons. Disasters averted, but disasters poss perfectly possible in the future. And I know Martin Rees is particularly worried about ones that might arise from nanotechnology, where you need regulation, but what regulation? This is all the subject of huge debate at the moment, in which none of us, no, no government official, no scientist, can escape some measure of responsibility. So I'd like to think there was some magic way of dealing with the problems that you very rightly raised, but I don't know of it. At the back there. I'm not sure which of you, one of you. <laughs> What I would simply say about that is that Malthus may have been wrong in 1790, or not wrong, but he was, his thesis in 1798 was proved to be correct in certain parts of the world but not in others. And by and large, people have uh, condemned Malthus for his simplification of a very complex issue. But on the other hand, I think I'm probably in what's called a neo-Malthusian. I think that um, all Malthus got wrong was his, um, was his timing. And there are those who can maintain very strongly that um, the fact, what some of the predictions of Malthus and the relationship between uh, resources and population may be all too true. But each time we've been a bit cleverer, and so far we've managed to postpone the issue, but it won't be postponed forever. And it all depends on the part of the world you're talking about. So I don't think Malthus can be regarded as wrong. You, you could certainly say that his predictions weren't correct at the, at the time. Likewise, the predictions of the, uh, of the Club of Rome in 1972 turned out to be wrong or, again, wrong, but possibly postponed. Um, so these various ideas that people have are all ideas that are floating around, and I think there are a lot of people who at least would call themselves neo-Malthusians today, given the kind of background that I've sketched out to you, about where we now are. Now, somebody at the back, very keen to speak. <laughs> Well, population control is a word that I tend to, to avoid because, of course, in China you have the policy of one child, one family. Um, one, yes, one child, one family, uh, which is something that you can perhaps do in China where the traditions, the cultural traditions are very different from our own. 